Today we are picking up at Psalm 23, and we intend to at least take a brief look at Psalms 24 and 25 as well. Uh, I mentioned as we were concluding the previous class session that Psalm 23 we were going to discover was really a Messianic psalm. Uh, we begin to realize these things when we, when we remember that the psalms in this book are arranged in an intentional order. They're not just scattered here at random throughout this book. And of course, we just finished last week with Psalm 22. We spent really our entire class session with Psalm 22, which is so remarkably um, messianic in that it concludes the prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. Uh, remember the, both the opening verse here, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the last prayer of that psalm, which is for in verse 22, which says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Both of those verses are said in the New Testament to have been the words of Jesus. And since both the first and the last of those, uh, verse 23 of Psalm 22 is not part of the prayer, it goes on to David is then beginning to speak about the Messiah and his work and the results of that. But those 22 verses, uh, since the New Testament says, okay, the first one and the last one, those are the words of Jesus. Then when we read all those words in between about his statements concerning um, his hands and his feet being pierced and his garments being uh, gambled for and all of that, this just has to be a prayer of the Messiah, the entire thing. Uh, well, that, that creates then a major messianic point in the book of Psalms. So we shouldn't think now, okay, that's all over with. Let's go to Psalm 23 and talk about something else. Let's remember that Psalm 23 includes that profound verse, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'm convinced that Psalm 23 is, is uh, a continuation of the topic that is found in Psalm 22, and that is the suffering of the Messiah, the, the uh, protection that was given to him, and the answer to his prayer. So let's take a look at Psalm 23. I know that probably many of you could quote it all the way through. It's only six verses. I'm going to read them. Then we'll make some comments on Psalm 23. Uh, it does say it's a Psalm of David. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now I'm wanting you to think as we start to read this, these are the words of the Messiah. Now we, we will not take away the wonderful benefit of this for our own personal use. Uh, there are levels of meaning, levels of applications of the scriptures. We're not saying you can only read this as a Messianic psalm, but you certainly can do so. And I think the primary meaning is this. So just think of these as the words of the Messiah himself, his prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The word that's translated soul there, the Hebrew word nephesh, is a word that means life, really. He restores my life. And we need to know that when we're thinking of this in terms of what Psalm 22 has just told us about him. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I want to make some comments about that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are your rod, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. These are the same enemies that we were just reading about in Psalm 22. You anoint my head with oil. Remember anywhere you see the word anoint, that's a clue that we're talking about the Messiah in the book of Psalms. Uh, the very word Mashiach uh, means one who is anointed. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Actually, there's a reference to uh, the Messiah's cup just a couple of psalms before this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, so let me kind of work backwards here perhaps a little bit. Start at the very last statement in, in verse 6. Uh, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, this is a reference to the temple. And you will see in the very next psalm, Psalm 24, all of these wonderful statements about um, lift up your head, O you gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Uh, these are references to the city of Jerusalem, the gates of the city and the doors of, of the temple, you everlasting doors. 
and uh, the king of glory will come in. Okay, so there, there's a connection between Psalms 23 and 24 about the house of the Lord and the temple. But remember, although at the superscription of this psalm we see that it's a psalm of David, remember there was no temple in the days of David. David wanted to build a temple. He was not allowed to do so. It was his son Solomon who built the temple. Even the tabernacle, that tent, uh, was not in the city of Jerusalem during the days of King David. He finally was able to bring the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant back into the city and put up a temporary tent there for it. But uh, this, is, uh, this is something more than just David. Now, again, we're not denying that this is a Psalm of David at all, but remember that David himself is a prophet and he's a messianic kind of person because the Messiah would come from David's loins. So this is much more than just David saying these things. He's saying them all right, but there's somebody else that the, that the Holy Spirit has in mind in these words. So let's go back up to the top now. The words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That whole idea of, of a shepherd is such a central biblical theme. Even the word pastor literally means shepherd. If anybody wants to know what is the pastoral role, if we're talking to a group of students about pastoral theology, well, what really is the role of a pastor? Is it a CEO? Is it a manager? Is it a boss? You know, is that what a pastor is? No, the biblical picture of the pastor is a shepherd. And a shepherd is the one who feeds the flock. He's the one who protects the flock. He's the one who leads them, so to speak, in green pastures. Really, that's not our topic today, but the Lord himself is the model for that. That kind of caring, nurturing role is really the role of, of the pastor. And so in this case, uh, the, the words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, if you remember the things that we just read in Psalm 22 about the thirst, uh, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue clings to the roof of my mouth and uh, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint and so forth. And this, really this poverty, in fact, the, the Old Testament even tells us, uses the word poverty in one of the Psalms to describe the Messiah. And uh, Paul picks that up in his writings and says, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was poor, uh, but he, he, he took, took on our poverty so that we could be rich in this great exchange of, uh, of his work for us. But now uh, there's, this, there's this recognition that this suffering that I'm going through in this valley of the shadow of death, this is not permanent. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He has an answer for me. Uh, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And that's a very interesting metaphor because, and I'm, by the way, I'm, I know very little about sheep. I just know what I read about them. But uh, what I read about sheep is that um, they, first of all, if they lie down, it's a sign that they're full. They've had all that they want to eat. And they will not um, drink from waters that are rushing waters. Uh, they will only drink from still waters. The rushing waters scare them, and so, so they won't go there. So this is very much described as a shepherd and sheep relationship. A relationship, yes, I've been in difficult circumstances, but I will be able to lie down and, uh, because he's leading me beside the still waters, and I will not want, I will, I will have all that I need in these circumstances of life. And then verse 3, which as I mentioned a moment ago, he restores my soul. Well, that's really contextually here with Psalm 22 is a reference to the resurrection, the, the, the restoration of the soul or the life, the nephesh of the Messiah. He will arise from the dead. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. The word righteousness is a long, fancy theological term that really is referring simply to what is right. He leads me in the right paths. And uh, he does this for his name's sake. And I mentioned I want to say a little bit more about that. We, of course, are people of the name. We love to talk about the name of the Lord. We love to talk about the name of Jesus, and rightly so. Uh, what we do need to recognize, in addition to maybe uh, how we usually think about the name of the Lord, is uh, when you talk about name in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, but it continues into the New, 
it's much more than just talking about a label. It's much more than talking about, well, my name is Daniel, and then that's the end of it. Uh, in Scripture, when we talk about a person's name, we are talking about that person's character. We're talking about that person's reputation. We're even talking about that person's worth. There's several aspects of the word name in the, in the word of God that we need to remember. Uh, we maintain a little bit of this today in our culture, even in the English language. If we say of a person, well, he has a good name, you don't ask, what is it? <laughs> you know, immediately we're talking about uh, he has a good reputation. He's a person of good character. You can trust that person because he has a good name. Um, the book of Proverbs says that uh, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And again, we don't say, well, give me a list of the good ones and that's one I'll choose. No, it's to be a person who is known as a person of good character is better than to be a rich person. And so here in this case, when it says he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake, for, for the Lord's namesake, what this means contextually is for the sake of his reputation. Because if the Messiah was not raised from the dead, if his soul was not restored, this would not be a good thing for the Lord's reputation because the Lord had promised David that he would bring the Messiah into this world through, again, through David's lineage. And so um, that had to be done in order to protect the reputation of the Lord, so to speak. He does this for his name's sake. God keeps his word. That's kind of what this is saying. He will do what he has said he will do. And then verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I heard a, a radio evangelist that I will not name here kind of uh, making fun of this idea here one time and said, well, a shadow never hurt anybody. Well, this is talking about, uh, it is using metaphorical language, of course, the shadow of death, but it's talking about death. Uh, the language that it's using does not in any way minimize what the Messiah experienced on the cross. His death was a horrible death where not only physically did he suffer, but also taking on him the sins of the entire world. But even though he would have that experience, according to verse 4, he did not need to fear any evil because even in the midst of that horrendous the situation on the cross, God was with him. You are with me. Again, compare that to Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some people thinking that that actually means the first person of the Godhead forsook the second or that the Father turned his back on the Son or that the deity withdrew from Jesus, whether, depending on whether we're talking from Trinitarian or oneness perspectives. None of that is true. And what that verse describes, again, is the emotional impact on the Messiah of taking on the sins of the world. He had this sense, like a sinner does, of being forsaken by God. Now, even in Psalm 22, he finally comes down in verse 21 and says, You have answered me. The answer did come for him uh, in the resurrection. But back to Psalm 23 and verse uh, for, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I don't know where this idea came from, but I remember a number of times when I was a boy growing up in the church, hearing preachers talk about this, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And they would tell this story about how if a little lamb was disobedient or strayed or something like that, that uh, the shepherd would actually use his rod to break the little lamb's legs and um, sort of teach him a lesson and then put him around his neck and carry him around that way. And then the little sheep and the, uh, the shepherd would bond and the little sheep from then on after healing would be perfectly obedient and never stray again. Now the thing is, there's not a word of truth in that. That's an absolute and complete myth. Uh, I did some research on that some years ago trying to find the root of that thing and it's just absolutely not true. Uh, the Lord is not a lamb abuser. He doesn't, he doesn't break our legs if we, if we have a wrong thought or something. That is not at all the relationship of the shepherd. Uh, actually, the rod and the staff, of course, the staff was needed for simply walking in uh, the hilly terrain, the valleys and the hills of, uh, of Jerusalem or Israel. 
the rod itself was, was an instrument that could be used to ward off uh, the wild animals that might attack the, the lambs and so forth. It was for protection, not for abuse. So we, we're not going to go down that route here today. Your rod and your staff, it's not they scare me, it's they comfort me <laughs> because you're going to protect me from those that are evil and uh, you're going to see me through this difficult terrain that we're in. Now, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Well, this can certainly refer in this context, once again, to the enemies that were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, we can see that in Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, where these uh, enemies are referred to as those who ridicule me, shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And again, we saw last week that those very words are spoken uh, and referred to in the book of Matthew in the New Testament by those passers-by who were there at the foot of the cross and saw Jesus hanging there. And the word table is, is, is a symbol of the provision uh, and blessing uh, that the Lord had for, uh, for the Messiah, as was the idea of this overflowing cup. My cup runs over. If you look at Psalm 16 and verse 5, and I think this will help us solidify the idea that this is a Messianic psalm. Psalm 16 and verse 5 reads, O Lord, you are, the, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Well, it's just, uh, what is it? It's uh, like three verses after that begins the text that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost and says this is about Jesus. And so in that same context here in Psalm 16, uh, this Messianic Psalm, the Messiah says, you are my portion, my inheritance, and my cup. Well, in Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. So all of this is reminding us this is a psalm about the Messiah who is anointed. The, the, the word oil is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And uh, we do read about the Holy Spirit coming uh, upon the Messiah in his baptism by John. And so all of these things just work together to uh, indicate the nature of this psalm. Then finally, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, the word follow is kind of a passive word. Uh, it kind of means these things sort of, you know, trail behind me, goodness and mercy. They're, they're coming. They're there, but they're sort of behind. That really doesn't give us the idea of the Hebrew word that is translated follow. It's an aggressive word. It means that the goodness and mercy of the Lord will pursue me, or you could even chase, say, chase me all the days of my life. So the goodness and mercy were not passive in, in their relationship to the Messiah, but very active uh, in his life. They will, they will pursue me. And then all, it says, all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the idea that, the, that this would be something that would be forever, again, indicates this is more than just David. It's more than just a human being. This is something describing something uh, eternal. And so let's take a look at a couple of other texts that I think will help us, again, solidify in our mind. This really can be read as a Messianic psalm. Take a look at, uh, for example, Zechariah. And uh, this will be your, your uh, next to the last book in the Old Testament in the order that the books are arranged in our Bibles. This is Zechariah chapter uh, 9 and verses 8 and 9. Zechariah 9 and 8 and 9 reads, I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. For now I have seen with my eyes, verse 9, uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, because your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we looked at that text early in this series of lessons. That verse is quoted in the New Testament in the book of Matthew concerning the fact that Jesus actually did ride on this donkey as he's coming into the city of Jerusalem. So that text suggests to us <clears throat> that a verse about 
about coming into Jerusalem, <clears throat> pardon me, can be a reference to the Messiah. Well, in connection with that, go over to uh, Malachi chapter 3, the next book. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Well, this idea, first of all, is that there is a new covenant to be made, and this messenger of the covenant is going to be coming to his temple. So when we, this is obviously a reference to the Messiah. He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord then will suddenly come to his temple. So going back to Psalm 23, uh, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever calls to our attention. Other texts like that that refer to the Messiah actually returning to the temple. The word that's translated dwell in verse 6, Psalm 23, verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Literally, the word means I will return to the house of the Lord forever. I'll return there. And you may wonder well, why this difference in translation. In this case, as in many cases, it has to do with whether we're translating from the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation, or whether we're translating from the Hebrew. And in this particular case, uh, when we read the Hebrew text, I will return to the house of the Lord forever. Now, we could talk about that a great deal from the book of um, uh, Ezekiel, which Susan and I just recently finished reading through in our Bible reading. <laughs> we were glad to get through the book. Of, so, you know, one scholar that I read, in fact, one of my favorite scholars, John Salehammer, said, you know, the book of Ezekiel gives all of this detail about the, the uh, millennial temple. He says, from some people, much too detailed uh, in that reading. And it really is. I mean, every little detail, what everything measures, it just goes on and on and on and on. And there's a lot of theories about what this millennial temple means. Um, I took a course, in fact, in, in the seminary on the book of Ezekiel, where we looked at all of this. And um, actually, at the seminary that I attended, which was Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, someone had taken the, the effort to really carefully examine all of those details and they and built a model of the, of the millennial temple from those details. And uh, they actually had some pictures of it in the book. The, the temple, I mean, the model itself was up in an attic somewhere. I guess not too many people were that curious about it. But, uh, but, but it is a very awesome thing. And I will say this about it, because here we're talking about the house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And uh, it's, it's, this, is a, this is something that we have not seen yet. This is not just talking about Herod's temple or something like that. But it is what we commonly refer to as the millennial uh, temple. And some people think that that temple indicates a return to the law of Moses because it does have a sacrificial system. It has uh, an altar and so forth. So some folks think that, uh, well, we're, you know, the millennium is going to be about going back to the law and everybody's going to be happy. Well, let's hope they'd be happier than they were under the law in the first place uh, when they were described as stiff-necked and rebellious and, and Moses even knew that they would never live up to these requirements. Well, that's not the case at all. What you have to notice in the detail is that millennial temple is not a replica of the temple of Solomon. It's, it, it, there's similarities there. But uh, what is really fascinating is what is not there in the millennial temple that, that Ezekiel describes. For example, there is no Ark of the Covenant at all. And uh, as you read that carefully, apparently, uh, that's because that what, uh, what would have been the place for the Ark of the Covenant is actually the throne room of the Messiah in this millennial temple. And the sacrificial system itself, is, there is an altar there, but you don't go up it in the same direction. It's not a, it's not a, a detailed replica at all. So um, I think the biggest question and if you ever read the book of Ezekiel, you'll see this. The biggest question about that temple is uh, that there's something called the sin offering. And so, you know, of course, we would ask the question, well, why will we need another sin offering in the future since Christ has already died? And uh, that's an offering once and for all, as the New Testament describes. And his death is once and for all. Well, again, there's lots of opinions about that. But if you, if you uh, just read it really carefully, You'll notice that it is apparently 
a memorial offering. It's not in order to effect forgiveness of sins. Again, that's been done by the work of the cross. It's a memorial. And that may sound really strange to you, but you and I, maybe without thinking about it, regularly participate in something in the church that's the same thing. And that is when we take communion. When we do that, Paul says, we are calling to mind, we're remembering uh, the work that Christ did for us on the cross. It's a memorial itself. And uh, I'm persuaded that uh, that particular thing that's described there in Ezekiel is a memorial of the work of Christ on the cross for us. Now, I can't answer every question about that, but that's, that's, I certainly know we're not going back to the law of Moses. That old covenant's done, and a new covenant has been established for us in the work of Christ. But, um, but that temple has, has a huge uh, level of significance in the Old Testament prophets. And again, this prophecy that the Messiah would return to the house of the Lord and would dwell there forever. And uh, so that's in the future. If I'm wrong about that, uh, then I'll find that out later on, and so will you, and we can all rejoice that we finally know the truth about it. But I'm just telling you what, what I think to this point. Now, having read Psalm 23, let's go to the next Psalm, Psalm 24, which continues a Messianic focus. Again, it's a Psalm of David, and it reads, uh, it's, it's not a long Psalm. Again, it's 10 verses, so I'll go ahead and read that. This is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. You know, if nothing else, this verse reminds us whatever may be going on around us today in our present world, in the nations of the world, and specifically in our nation, and whatever questions and disappointments and fears and so forth that we may have, just remember, in the final analysis, the earth is the Lord's. And everything in the earth is the Lord's. And he is the one who founded it, verse 2 says, upon the seas. He established it upon the waters. It belongs to him. We may be presently abusing it, misusing it, uh, living in rebellion. But ultimately, we will discover that everything belongs to the Lord's. But then there's the question. Remember, we just talked about the Messiah returning to the temple, and that temple is located on the hill of the Lord. All the prophets talk about that. So the question arises now in verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now that the Messiah is there, who else will be qualified to be there? Don't you want to be there? Well, yes. You know, we talk about heaven. We, we use the word heaven. We, uh, we say we want to go there. Um, the old, old gospel song years ago said something about everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Well, we know that one requirement to get there is to die. And then, of course, the hope of, of the resurrection and the rapture is certainly there. But who will be qualified to be there? We had a similar psalm earlier already in the book of Psalms, some of the same language. It says, uh, who may stand in his holy place? And, of course, the holy place is a reference to the temple. So that's the question. Well, here's the, here's the answer to that. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is not complicated. Uh, you know, as they say about some things, it's not really rocket science. In order to stand in a holy place before a God who is himself holy, before one who is clean, requires clean hands. It requires a pure heart. And it requires not worshiping idols, not lifting up your soul to idols. Uh, it requires not swearing deceitfully. Uh, in other words, not deceiving, not being a liar and all this kind of thing. Um, the, that kind of person doesn't mean that that's all that there is. There are other character qualities that we need to, that we find in Scripture. But that's the kind of person who can be there. This kind of person is the one who will receive blessing from the Lord. Uh, again, and I don't want to downplay anything at all, unnecessarily, but this is just talking about um, not practicing sin, not living a sinful life, um, 
when we, when we say words like that, I know immediately in our minds, all of us think about something we've done that we know was a sin. Uh, and we might even have done it this morning before we came to church. I mean, it doesn't have to be something decades ago. Uh, but remember, the whole idea of this prohibition is not being one who practices sin. First John talks about that. The book of First John, written to believers, tells us that we are sinners. And if we say that we're not, we're liars. So it would be best not to add to your sin by lying about it and saying that you're not a sinner. It would be good to go ahead and confess that. But it also uh, uh, tells us that if we sin, you know, John says, I'm writing to you so that you wouldn't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate with the, righteous, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But much of the book of John, especially in the King James, uh, it's translated in such a way that it looks like if you ever commit a sin, you're done. But again, in the original language, the Greek language there, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the tense that is used <clears throat> is a present active indicative. It's, it means if you, li if you practice sin. Many of the newer translations will render it that way, that if you practice sin, if this is a way of life for you, then uh, you're in trouble with God. Uh, of course, we don't want to sin at all. We shouldn't sin at all. But we know that we're fallen and we know that we do. And so uh, John holds out the hope for us that um, if we confess our sins, we have fellowship together and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth. And again, that old King James, that ETH correctly shows us, this means if we practice this and if we, if we see cleanseth, it means it's an ongoing, continuous thing. His blood continually cleanses us from sin if we confess that we are sinners and if we're living with our faith in the Lord. So uh, I, I know many people through the years, I've taught many folks, I've had lots of exposure to the fact that some of our own people who have done the Acts 238 all the way through uh, still question their salvation. And they question it because they know they are not perfect. And so they think, well, if I'm not perfect, then maybe, uh, maybe I'm lost. And it's so regrettable. Uh, you need to have the assurance of salvation. And if you realize the fullness of what Christ has done for you on the cross, and if your faith is him, in him exclusively for salvation, you don't have anything to worry about. Uh, to worry about it is to question the finality of his work on your behalf. <laughs> uh, Susan and I were driving along the other day. We saw a little sign. Oh, it's in front, front of a church on Mexico Road there in St. Peter's that said, uh, pray and let God worry. And I thought, that's some good advice. I didn't realize right then I just discovered this morning that's actually a statement that was made by Martin Luther, the reformer of 500 years ago. I told Susan before he... You know, before Martin Luther came to his understanding of this, and I don't think I mentioned this, but especially his reading of the book of Romans, uh, his life was characterized by worry. And that's about all he did was worry about his salvation. And uh, he was, at that time, he was a Roman Catholic uh, monk, and he would confess his sins for hours. And you should read his story. He would, he would literally kneel there confessing his sins for hours. And then he would get up and on his walking just a few feet away from the confessional, he would remember something he hadn't confessed. He'd go right back and start all over again. And uh, his superior uh, in, in, that, um, in that monastery realized that he's going to lose his sanity. And so he sent Martin Luther to teach uh, the Bible in a new university that had just opened up. And remarkably enough, Martin Luther at that time had a master's degree in theology, but had never studied the Bible because in the Roman Catholic system, you study the church traditions and what somebody else you know, taught that the Bible had said. And so the first thing that he taught when he got to this new university, Wittenberg, was from the book of Psalms. <laughs> that was his first assignment. Uh, his next was the book of Romans. And the book of Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17 brought him up short when he read about the righteousness of God and justification by faith, then he decided not to worry anymore. He just prayed and let God worry. <laughs> oh my. Well, I didn't have that in my notes today. I just happened to think of that from seeing that sign. But uh, in other words, to live for God does not require you to worry about your sins. To live for God requires faith in Jesus Christ. It requires, of course, confession of our sins to the Lord. But if you pray the Lord's Prayer every day, that's part of it. Forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who trespass against us.
And Jesus is the one, by the way, who said we should pray that prayer when his disciples asked, teach us to pray. He gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer. But back to Psalm 24 now and um, verse 6. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. Here, Jacob is simply representing those who are people who seek the Lord, not necessarily Jacob himself. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, there are various places where uh, a whole group of people will be referred to as uh, by some person's name. And even the Messiah himself is referred to as Israel in one place. And so context means everything when reading the scriptures, so just keep that in mind. And then verse uh, 7, these wonderful words, which I think are part of, um, who actually put this into music? Uh, was it uh, Handel? I'm not really sure. I should have checked this. Lift up your head, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Again, a reference to the city of Jerusalem itself and to the temple. And the king of glory shall come in. Now, by the way, uh, we can look many places in Scripture like Revelation 19, where Jesus is said to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. This is a messianic psalm. The king of glory shall come in. The question, who is this king of glory? In verse 8, the scripture tells us he is the Lord. But notice that's all capitals for you there. That's Yahweh. He is Yahweh, strong and mighty. He is, again, Yahweh, the Lord, mighty in battle. And it, that kind of goes right along with Revelation chapter 19. Lift up your head, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Once again, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Again, that's Yahweh. When it says the Lord of hosts, it's referring to the angelic host. He is the king of glory, Salah. Now, by the way, it just comes to my mind. I've been doing some work recently in the book of James again. And, uh, you know, the book of James talks about the uh, Lord of Sabaoth. If you take a look at James, I think it's, uh, let's see, this, yes, this is uh, James chapter 5 and verse 4. And James being, I believe, uh, the first book written in the New Testament. And fr from very much from a Jewish perspective, written by James, the Lord's half-brother. But just notice how this is used in this context here. James chapter 5 and verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Um, I can't take the time to deal with this now, but there are so many references here in the book of James, contrary to the thinking of some, about the Messiah. It starts in James chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, specifically by word, continues in James chapter 2 and verse 1, referring to Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. But here, uh, some people think this is the Lord of the Sabbath. No, it's a completely different word. The Lord of Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts. And so in this book, this little book of James, if you notice in James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of uh, God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 2, verse 1, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Uh, with partiality or with respect to persons. And then this reference to the Lord of Sabaoth or the Lord of hosts. Okay, the Lord Jesus Christ really is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of the angelic host, in other words. And as we go back now to Psalm 24 and see how this concludes with verse 10, who is this King of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. And he is the King of glory. And then Psalm 25 has 22 verses. About all I've got time to tell you is you should always notice when anything has 22 verses, <laughs> 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. This is, Psalm 25 is an acrostic. It has some irregularities in it, but that's not unusual for acrostics. So and when I say some irregularities, sometimes there will be one, uh, one letter of the Hebrew alphabet that may be missing for some reason in that in that or in some cases a very old version of the Hebrew alphabet actually has a couple of the letters reversed sometimes you'll see that but still it shows intention in its uh, arrangement 
uh, no accident there. And you can read the comments uh, in your study guide there on Psalm 25, which are also found in the Apostolic Study Bible. As I've noticed here, or noted rather, the last several lessons, uh, these notes are coming from the Apostolic Study Bible. I did write the notes because I wrote the notes in the book of Psalms for that work. So I'm going to leave that for you to read, and we'll come back one more time next week and have our final lesson on the Messiah and the Psalms. Thank you for coming today. God bless you as you're going.